Hey, this is Johnny Kelly from Typo Negative in Danzig, and you're listening to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. We're putting the band back together. The numbers all go to 11. I'm talking about bands that rock. Led Zeppelin. What about Sabbath? ACDC. Motorhead. Does that mean it's louder? Is it any louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? We're not worthy! We're not worthy! Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These guys are 11. I get up above the ground and raise my head days like this. Think I should be dead. One for Satan, two for me. Let's cheat the devil, it's fun. Welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jeff Unteed, and with me in Dog Bowl Studios is my co-host... Coach Nez. You can find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Lipson or any pod catchers. You can find us on Facebook or Twitter at No Shock Pod. You can also find the Nothing Shocking Podcast on Rock Rage Radio every Tuesday evening at 10 p.m. Central Time. We would like to thank Bob Zerl for his co- technical contributions. Our sponsor is Ragged Records in downtown Rock Island, Illinois, soon to be coming back to downtown Davenport, Iowa. We would also like to thank the Hong Kong Sleepover for letting us use their music for our intro and bumper ending. And tonight's guest is... Johnny Kelly of Typo Negative. And Danzig and... Uh, Black Label Society. Kill Devil Hill. And he recently joined Quiet Right. And A Pale Horse Called Death. Yeah. So don't forget about that one as well. Hookers and Blow. And Hookers and Blow. We forgot about that. Yeah. How could we? We talked about that in the interview. Yeah, Dizzy Reed, a yeah. Nothing Shocking podcast alumni. It was a lot of fun. He uh, he was a, uh, went by really fast. He was a um, good storyteller. Great storyteller. Uh, a man, a lover of dogs like you and yes. I, our families are. We, had, we, talk about we all adopt dogs, so it was great to hear that. Well, music news. So, yeah. No, I got, music news, yeah. yeah. Yeah, music news. I got uh, a Wolfgang uh, Van Halen just recently announced his new band, Mammoth, tribute to his dad. Yeah. Uh, the song is called Distance. It's a catchy tune. Uh, if you're expecting uh, big time guitar riffs out of this tune, you're not going to get it. This is a tribute song to his father, so it has sentimental value. Nice. Uh, it's very catchy. Okay. Enjoyed it. Caught up with it two days ago. I gave it a good listen. And it was very good. Uh, now let's go to yeah. the purchases of the week. Uh, so I, I purchased the new ACDC Power Up. I know, I know it's uh, you know it's that age old formula that they use, but I, I enjoy ACDC. It's good power. It's good party rock. Um, good sentimental value. The the you know if this album fits right in there with uh, you know right probably you know Back in Black two you know <laughs> sure um, and it sounds like ACDC yeah right? I, I also got the new uh, L A L A Guns uh, the, uh, we re- we recently interviewed Kurt Frolick yep. uh, that that version with Steve Riley and the uh, Renegades album yeah the Renegades um, and that that is awesome I, I have had that one in my player all, in my car player all week yeah and that's so cool because. Uh, <clears throat> This version of L.A. Guns seems like is it's as strong as the other version of L.A. Guns. Yeah. So it's good you, to see. And if you haven't listened to the interview, check it out. Absolutely. Uh, my purchase of the week uh, was today. And if you know me, if you've listened to this podcast or follow me on Quad City Rock and Roll Junkies, that I'm a huge uh, East Coast hardcore punk yeah. rock fan. Yeah. And my purchases today uh, was uh, the Vanishing Point by Underdog, which will be this will be my I think eighth <laughs> copy of this uh, of the CD. Um, I also purchased uh, Chromag's Alpha Omega. Yeah. That's my second copy. Um, and what else? Uh, there was another Chromag's uh, CD that I purchased. I can't remember which one it was. It came into the group of four, and then Uniform Choice, Staring into the Sun. It is my third copy on CD. I own two copies of nice. it on vinyl, and I think I have a 45 single from awesome. Staring of the Sun. So um, my love for, uh, well, actually, Uniform Choice is West Coast hardcore punk rock. So that one kind of got thrown in there with the East Coast guys. So, yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's that was my big purchases. So Cool. Yeah, I'm excited. Some good listens. Yeah, this go go straight into the old collection. So right. without further ado, let's get to our interview with Johnny Kelly. Good night. Good night. Uh, welcome to the Nothing Shocking Podcast. Uh, Johnny, I would like you to introduce you to my co-host, Jeff Unteed. Hey, Johnny. This is Jeff. How's it going? How are you, Jeff? 
Well, fantastic. Wait, thank you for being on. 2020 has been such a frustrating year for artists. <laughs> How have you? <laughs> what a shit show, huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Understatement of the year. Um, yeah. We just got done with another uh, an interview before yours. It was the same thing. <laughs> I I guess you know what have you been doing in 2020 to keep your hands from being idle? Yeah. Uh, well, I've been trying to keep busy. You know, like for for the most part, it's it's been okay. Uh, not really doing too many too many gigs. I mean, I've only done a couple right. this year. Unfortunately, um, mainly I've been uh, home uh, doing uh, lessons. Mm. Cared- Hang on a second. You there? <laughs> yeah, we're here. There we go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I guess that's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you left off, you were doing lessons. Yeah, uh, really. Yeah, uh, for the most part. And uh you know, just home like everybody else. I've done a, we did a few shows with Quiet Riot this this year, not many. Um, did one with uh, Hookers and Blow just a few weeks ago in Vegas. Mm-hmm. That was with a that was a, um a live stream show that was uh happened at a club on uh, Fremont Street so there was there was some people there not many you know because of the mm-hmm. social distancing sure. thing but it was like one of the first live shows in Vegas that they've had since the since all the lockdowns oh so cool um speaking of quiet riot yeah, yeah back in uh, September 9th of 2020 it was announced that you had joined quiet riot as the replacement for frankie benelli um mm-hmm. what is the status of quiet riot uh, going forward with, with no original members from that metal health album well uh i guess uh, you know i guess it's pretty safe to say we probably won't be making any new music yeah. you know it, it's more or less along the lines of you know we'll go out we'll play shows uh it's more or less in, uh, like a, a celebration of the guys that aren't here anymore Mm-hmm. you know uh and that's that's really it you know just going out playing shows playing those you know those classic songs that everybody you know grew up with and and uh just carrying the torch for what they would you know what what everyone before us did absolutely go ahead jeff <laughs> oh, he he froze up so i'll take the next question how Sorry about that well that was that was awkward <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm going to try that on my answer. <laughs> my, my next answer. <laughs> Jeff does great editing, yeah. so this will be no yeah. problem for him. <laughs> no, leave it. That's fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> totally organic. All right. I got my question. Yeah. Sorry. I gathered my thoughts there for a second. So, after uh, you know, he was talking about filling in for Quiet Reiner drummer, you've also uh, replaced another uh, famous drummer in uh, Vinny Apice. Uh, when you filled yeah. in for uh, Kill Devil Hill, so is there is there any um, what do you call that um, pressure to, to to fill in after after some of those drummers? Well, p- pressure. I I don't know if it was pressure. I mean, um, there is a certain uh, you know, like for fans of of those drummers and those bands, there was a certain expectation. Yeah. You know, so so you have to you know you you kind of you know there's there's a responsibility that comes with that. And, you know, like if, if it wasn't something that I was capable of doing, you know, for starters, I wouldn't be there. You know, they'd be like, all right, well, you know, you kind of <laughs> suck, but we'll use you. We'll use you anyway. Uh, no, it's, uh, you know, like with Kill Devil Hill, you know, it was pretty exciting because, you know, of course, like, you know, to get the opportunity, you know, to play with Rex and I've been from friends with Rex for for years. You know, since Typo and Pantera had toured together, mm-hmm. yeah, and uh, so that was cool. And then uh, Rex isn't playing with the band anymore. And then you know, after we left, I, I got to play with him again in his own band, which was fun too. You know, mm-hmm. it wasn't really like you know, it was more you know, like a you know, like a, a blues bass, like you know, classic rock kind of thing. So just so it was, you know, it was a little bit of a different uh you know the atmosphere but it was still cool to like you know to be able to play with them you know like looking at my career on paper it's pretty cool yeah it's very cool yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's why i froze up i wasn't sure where to start you know like, like you know like to, if you look at it on paper it's like you know it's, I, i've been pretty fortunate you know i've got to play with you know some real high caliber people over the years and which is you know which is, which is great 
you know, but you know, I guess like, you know, like when you're living in it, you do, you know, you're just doing your thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, it seems like, you know, like, you know, post, you know, typo after Peter passed away, it's been a lot of hustling, mm. you know, getting the opportunity to like, you know, play mm -hmm. with different people, you know, different bands, and, you know, doing different things and stuff. And, uh, you know, and so, so you're not really thinking about, wow, you know, playing with this guy. Oh, I got to play with Zach Wilde, uh, you know, <laughs> covering for Frankie Benali. I replaced right, Dan Apathy. Right. You know, like, you know, like these were all people that I went to go see in concert when <laughs> I was a kid and like, you know, had their records and stuff. But I never really take a step back and think, wow, you know, I really got to play with, you know, some pretty cool people. <laughs> yes, you, you have. know, like, uh, like I catch myself sometimes like, you know, going, wow, well, you know, I'm in a band with. You know, I play in a band with the, you know, one guy's from Wasp, one guy's from Quiet Riot, and another one's from fucking Guns N' Roses. And it's like, you, you, it's like when we're all together, it's like, you know, like the last thing that comes up in conversation is those bands. <laughs> you know, but at, at the at the end of it, like, you know, it's like, you know, it was funny, uh, you know, like playing with those guys in Hunkers and Blows. It's it's so much fun. And, uh, you know, even if like, you know, if, if, if it isn't something like, you know, whatever, if we're not making any money or like, you know, whatever it is, you know, like we just love being around each other and just like basically just sitting around and just talking shit. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, so like, you know, like we do a lot of texting, you know, even when we're not, when we're not like, you know, playing shows together and there, there, there's times where it's like, you know, we can, you know, the, could be a better part of a year where we hadn't played, but we're constantly in touch with each other every day. Like, you know, sending jokes or like, you know, basically just talking shit. And one night we're going back and forth in the thread. And then uh, like, you know, Dizzy sends a text that says, look, I'm going to jump off the phone right now. You know, just played Madison square garden. I'm going to go hang out a little bit, <laughs> 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 you know? But, but, and so then you, like, you know, like you take a step back and you're like, holy shit, the guy just played Madison square garden and he's sitting somewhere in a dressing room on his phone. Like, you know, sharing memes with us <laughs> you know cool. as you say that we had uh, ripper owens on years ago and right. he, he had a really um i don't know if it was a strange analogy to it but a unique analogy when he joined judas priest you know he like he said how do i become members with my you know yeah. a band members with my idols and then all of a sudden he's a band members with his idols and now he can't yeah. now they're his friends and he can't look at them as idols anymore he said it, 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 it changes everything yeah yeah, yeah it really does yeah. It, it he yeah. and he said it was a big changer when he got on the tour bus and uh glenn tipton and kk downing were carrying their golf clubs with him he said this is so unmetal right now it's ridiculous you know? <laughs> oh yeah there's a lot of that yeah. a lot of it yeah but i wanted to kind of touch upon um uh the quite right thing again uh, uh -huh. we were when the podcast first started years ago we were listening to a a, a gene simmons interview and this was we had Billy Sherwood of Yes on, and it was kind of went hand in hand. It, Gene was explaining um, how he thought that the the kissed ki kissed kiss <laughs> brand um, could live without any original members. It could still go. It could still go with replacement musicians, and it could still be this machine and brand. And we asked Billy Sherwood that same question because, in essence, that's kind of what ha is happening with Yes right now. They're really dwindling down to. You know, yeah, original. there aren't too many. Right. Left. Isn't there like a, isn't there like two versions of it now? There's like the the John Anderson one, yeah. and then yeah. right Steve Howe will not play with them or something, and something then Chris like Squire that. passed away. Right, right. And, uh, yeah, I know there's like there's like a bunch of weird stuff going on there. Right, and you know, Billy Sherwood, even though he is a he replaced Chris Squ you know, Chris Squire, um, mm -hmm. he really felt as though that. The yes brand. I you know, I'm saying it brand instead of band because in essence that's what they are these days. Um, yeah, it's yeah. Go ahead, it, go ahead. That it's you're saying. that it's a these situations are sustainable with prolific musicians and it doesn't have to be any original members. It doesn't even have to be any secondary members. It could be on the third generation of members. You know, what is your thought on that process? I think like, you know, like depending on, depending on the band and, you know, depending on their, like, you know, I guess their body of work, you know, sure. I mean, there are some bands, there are some bands that like, you know, like they won't, they won't have any value at all with all the original members. Nobody's going <laughs> to want to see them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
you know, but it's like, you know, like you take a band like Yes and like, you know, you think about their their catalog and, and you know, how big they've, they've been throughout the, their entire career. You're talking mm-hmm. about like 50 years. Right, right. You know, at 50 plus, you know, like they're, you know, if, as long as, I guess as long as like, you know, like the presentation, like, you know, like whatever's being, you know, presented is honest. You know, and people want to hear the songs. That's really what dictates it. You know, if people still yeah. want to go to the show and hear the songs, they they'll keep the band going. Why not? Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, if nobody wants if nobody wants to hear it, then there's really no point in going any further. Right. Good, Jeff. Uh, we'll take it back to your uh, uh, maybe songwriting process or, or recording with with some of the different bands. Like, how has it been different recording with Danzig than recording with Typo Negative? Uh, Danzig, I mean, it's, it's very challenging with with recording with Glenn, you know, and and not in a bad way. It's just that, uh, like, we don't really do any, um, like rehearsing, you know, because, uh, most of the time I live in, you know, I lived in New York, you know, my whole life. And now I live in Texas. Um, you know, it'd be like, you know, if I was in California for a couple of days or whatever, go to the studio, you know, Glenn would like. You know, like he basically like, you know, just show me some ideas and basically just give me like a general direction as in, you know, like, a, you know, there's like the three things that that he goes for with the drumming. You know, he'd be like, you know, play this like ACDC, <laughs> play this like Bonham, play this like like Black Sabbath. Those are his those are his three go to's. And uh, so, like, you know, I'll, I'll make a couple of different passes, like, you know, whatever. Say there's a, a song that he's working on. There's, like, you know, he has a couple of parts of it. You know, the song may not even be completed yet. Mm-hmm. And I'll just make passes, and I'll try, like, you know, different things, try different feels, you know, a couple of different fills here and there. You know, just try different things. And then he'll go back and listen to it, and then he'll tell the engineer, all right, we'll use that, we'll use that. I don't like that, you know, and... And then they'll piece, he'll piece the songs together that way. You know, when we worked with Typo, when we, you know, the, the, the songwriting process would take months. You know, we would rehearse the songs. Then we would do demos of them. And the demos were basically full-on productions. They could have mm-hmm. been the record themselves. Mm-hmm. And then they got re-recorded again mm-hmm. after that. The drums, the drums and the keyboards were always like, you know, they would stay from the demos and then, you know, guitars and, you know, vocals and stuff and the bass and that would all get redone later on. But the, the demos that we did were basically like, you know, full production records. Mm. And then it was like, you know, when the records were, you know, when, when that part was, was finished, then it was, you know, it was just a matter of just, you know, uh, you know, replicating what was done on the demos, but in a, you know, a more professional environment you know better studio better equipment you know that kind of stuff you there was a lot of a lot of time put into oh. songwriting mm-hmm. you've worked with big personalities big persona uh big big time ego <laughs> and front men and what have you um <laughs> yeah. and you know that goes along with working with glenn uh, glenn danzig or peter Steele. Uh, i guess uh-huh. how has how do you or how is that molded you as far as you know adaptability goes when it comes to playing live recording you know with these different characters you know and these guys are characters in their own right uh, yeah they are you know and uh you know when you you know working alongside somebody and then you know like what you'll see from someone saying like an interview or how they want to be uh you know portrayed you know, a lot of times it's, you know, it could be, you know, it could be basically two different people. You know, Peter was basically the same person, no matter what, what was going on. You know, he was the same. And it was, uh, you know, I've known, I knew Peter, I met him when I was a teenager and we were friends for years before he even joined the band. And, you know, and then I worked for the band, you yeah. know, for, for a little bit. So there really wasn't that like, you know, you know, with Peter, you know, well, with Typo, there wasn't that, like, you know, employee, employer, you know, relationship. You know, every everybody else that I've played with, pretty much, it's like, you know, like, they basically, like, you know, I work for them. You know, so it's not like, you know, I, I can't, you know, sit around and, like, you know, whatever, dictate, you know, I think it should go this way, I think we should do this, I think, you know, like, whatever, this should be this way. It's basically, you know... 
here's your here's your work you know here's the job at hand do your job thanks <laughs> <laughs> you know here's some money <laughs> that works too <laughs> You know, but I mean, like, you know, it does take like, you know, uh, I keep on saying, you know, a lot. <laughs> so do I. Um, you have to realize the environment you're in, you know, that, that I guess that's part of like, you know, like the professional aspect of it, you know, when it comes to the, uh, you know, to the business end, you know, playing in those other bands, they're not my band. So it's not like, you know, really all it is. My job is to play drums, you know, don't miss bus call. <laughs> don't, don't go on stage drunk you know do a good job you know and Make that's it singer look good <laughs> yeah okay. but at the same time like you know glenn's been able like you know like for instance with dancing it was just uh i just it just came across you know one of my social media things that i've been playing with glenn now for 18 years that's a long gotta time. be doing something right yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this lineup that glenn has has been together for over 10 years now yeah and i really think it's the you know the people themselves and it's i think it's because we're all uh, east coast guys so we have the same kind of uh you know sarcasm you know uh, sharp-tongued wit you know the uh you know, the constant, like, you know, ball breaking of each other and stuff like that. So I think, I think like for Glenn, he's, he's gotten a lineup where he's in a comfort zone and he likes the idea, especially with us. We, for instance, we haven't played, we haven't played together in two years. Like the last week was like two, literally two years since we played the last dancing show. Glenn was busy the last, before the lockdown, Glenn was busy with, doing misfit shows and he was working on a movie so you know we haven't played but glenn could call us up tomorrow and we could have a show next week and we'll be able to you know do like you know a quick rehearsal and we'll be able to go out there and nine out of ten people wouldn't even know that we hadn't you know been in a room together in two years yeah that's awesome that is cool yeah. so he likes that yeah and who wouldn't yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like I say that to Steve, I, I tell Zing that all the time. I'm like, I was like, it doesn't get worse. I was like, it doesn't get better, but it doesn't get worse. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's always the same. And it doesn't matter if we rehearse for two weeks or if we rehearse for three hours, which we've done that where we hadn't been together. The band hadn't played together in, in months. And, you know, there was like, whatever, a fly out date. We go do a quick like afternoon of rehearsal, go, you know, go, fly to the show play the show and it was like we'd been on tour for you know two months yeah. <laughs> <It> was, <laughs> I, I sit there and i scratch my head i was like how did that happen <laughs> that's a nice and, and, and that's a, that is such a luxury for you guys to have that you know it, it's 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 a good thing you know for sure you know at the same you know like typo was kind of like that too because we had been playing together for so many years we you know when we would have a tour coming up we would only rehearse for like a few days maybe a week, you know, like get the crew guys, you know, fly them into town and, you know, they, you know, get acclimated to having, you know, a set, you know, and just running through the songs. We'd run through the songs a few times and then that was it. We were on a bus and we were flying, you know, whatever, driving to the first show. Mm. Yeah. Jeff, yeah. take the next question. All right. So um, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a big fan of covers and when, when bands mm -hmm. do them uh, in their kind of a unique way that make them sound like they're like they wrote them. Uh, one of the first right. covers I remember from Typo Negative was Cinnamon Girl from Neil Young. Um, right. What, uh, what what can you tell us about your your, your process in picking a cover or, or, or some of the ones you've recorded? A lot of stuff. Well, the ones that we, we were, uh, the ones that we had recorded, they all came from uh, P Peter suggested. Them. Yeah. He was like, I want to do a cover of this song. And uh, for, like, for instance, Cinnamon Girl, that started out when we were going on tour with uh, Queensryche. Peter wanted to do a cover of Cinnamon Girl for the live set. So we came up with an, uh, you know, with a rendition of it and we were just, you know, just performing it live. And then when the tour was over and we were going to start working on October Rust, we, we wound up doing a, a version of it. We, we recorded a version of it for the record. I can't remember if it was something that was like the intention was to 
use it for something else or you know somewhere else down the road or if it was recorded specifically for the record but i just remember you know like we we did a version of it and then it wound up on the record then it wound up becoming a single you know but it it just started out as something to just play during the show lot which was like we really weren't you know throughout most of our career you know we were kind of like you know a really ugly wedding band (laughs) 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 you know like an ugly covers band like a bar band because like a lot of times it would start like you know it would really just start out as something is you know uh, more along the lines of like a goof or something and then we would wind up like, you know, jamming on, like, Sabbath songs during our set, just, like, in the middle of, of the set. Like, you know, Peter, whatever, he would just come up with some kind of bass line or something from some whatever random Black Sabbath song, and then a bunch of us would jump in. Except for Josh. Josh never liked jamming or screwing around. <laughs> he would, like, walk off stage, go get a drink, go have a cigarette or something, and, and we're sitting there acting like idiots. Yeah. <laughs> but it was really, it was just us having fun. Mm-hmm. Very cool. And, you know, and I guess it comes, it goes back to that time when you were a kid and you were learning how to play and you'd play covers with your friends and stuff. And (laughs) that was it, except now there were hundreds of people in front of us (laughs) while we were, you know, being stupid. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So um, I kind of have like a National Enquirer question for you. And I've read in various sources that, you know, you're the drummer of Pell Horse Called Death. Then you're out of the band out of the band then you're back in the band what is your status in that band are you active or you're not active in that band i am not active in the band right now (laughs) no but it was i guess it did seem like that it did like being being like you know you know whatever just you know doing my thing you know just it didn't really seem like that you know uh dramatic you know you know it was like we you know we we on the second record, you know, we finished the tour. Everybody kind of went their separate ways and stuff like that. And then I moved. I moved out of I moved out of New York. Now, because I moved, Sal thought that I had quit the band. <laughs> <laughs> and he saw me. I was rehearsing with Kenny and Silvertoon because we all rehearse at like the same rehearsal studio mm-hmm. in New Jersey. And uh, I go up to New York often. You know, I still have family there. I, you know, work there. And uh, so I, I go up to New York often. So I was at rehearsal, and the Pale Horse, they were working with another drummer. And they were in the room, like, after us or before us. Like, you know, it's an hourly rehearsal room. So it was, you know, so we were, like, you know, we were in the room. And Sal sees me. He's like, what are you doing here? I was like, oh, I'm rehearsing. What's up? <laughs> I'm rehearsing with Kenny. <laughs> He's like, you, you come up here? I was like, yeah, dude, I come up I come up at least once a month. <laughs> He's like, oh, shit, I had no idea. But then the next day he called me, hey, you know, you want to play back, you want to come, you know, play in the band again. And, and that's how I wound up whatever coming back. Cool. But then after, you know, like after uh, the last, uh, what did we do? We went to Europe last year. No, it was actually, was it this year? I can't remember. We were just, I think it was before Christmas mm. so- yeah, in the fall. Yeah, we we went to we went to Europe. We did it. We did a few weeks in Europe, and then after that, you know, when I got home, it was just you know making some changes and stuff. And I was like, you know, we kind of did what it, you know, what I set out to do with the band, and that was, that was it. You know, no drama. Is it just kind of one of those things where, with artists, it you know when that when this when a window of a band, you know, hey, if I'm, I'm here for two albums or for two tours or whatever it is. And I, I, well, I, never, I never like, you know, like when I, uh, you know, like with anything that I do or like, you know, like with any band that I play in, I don't really look at it and say, all right, you know, here's my three year plan or, my, <laughs> you know, my two, my, you know, I'm going to just, you know, I'll do one record with this band, you know, and then, and then I'll go, you know, whatever. I don't, I don't operate that way. I just, you know, I just float, <laughs> you know, well, like whatever happens, wherever the wind takes me. But you know, a lot of artists do do that. They're like, "Hey, I'm I'm here for for two albums and I'm out." Or you know, that happens. It seems like a lot with the supergroup thing. It's a t- uh, two album deal and they're done or whatever. Well, that's if you know. Well, that's if they know that they have that going on. Mm-hmm. You know that they whatever. I guess like you know they're signing a contract, so that they're, they're you know they're they're obligated. You know they're making a commitment, so you, they know that they have to do that at least like you know at least make two records. 
you know, with there's, you know, anything that I've been a part of, you know, since type O, sure. it, 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 it hasn't had any bearing on me. Mm. Um, in 2011, you replaced Will Hunt of Black Label Society for the European, European portion of that tour. Um, can you yeah. talk a little bit more about that opportunity that you had? How long did it last? Uh, what was that? That was, uh, that was that tour. I was, I was with them for a month. Oh, so not very long. No, no. I just, I just I did that tour with them. They were, uh, they were on tour in Europe and will also plays for, uh, Evanescence. Right. And before he went out with black label, there wasn't any scheduling conflicts. And then he got a call and was like, you need to be back in the U S by whatever date it was. You know, you need to be back here. And then, so Will called me to ask me if I could cover for him, you know, finish, finish that tour because he had to go back home. Ah, because online sources state that Will Hunt was injured and that's why you had to take over for him. So that's false. No, no, there's no, no, he had to go home. Yeah. He had, he had other things, other, you know, other things that he had to take care of. No, he wasn't hurt. Ah, so that's the first I'm hearing of that. That was almost no. ten years ago. That was the first time I've heard that. Uh, it would <laughs> actually it it had it had said I read it this morning when I was kind of looking over um, some stuff that he was suffering from I believe back pain or something to that nature, and then uh, he had to take a medical excuse, and that's when you came in to save the day. <laughs> no, no, he no, he called me up and he, you know, he had to, he had to go home and. It was, that was it, you know. It was a scheduling conflict that that uh, he couldn't get out of. He couldn't sort it out. Ah, there you go. Cool. All right, go ahead, Jeff. What's uh, yeah, either one of the largest or one of your most favorite uh, live performances, like <laughs> venue, like where where you played? The largest one we ever played, I think, was uh, Woodstock in Poland, which was like you know at the time <laughs> it was like you know it's gone on to like you know be like this really big thing, but it was like one of the first ones. So basically, it was a total shit show. <laughs> but there was two hundred and fifty thousand people. Awesome. <laughs> so, so it was a well attended shit show. Yeah. <laughs> and so, what had happened? How it became a shit show, I have no idea. But uh, it was like outside of like, uh, oh man, I want to see. It was either Warsaw or Krakow. And so our hotel was, I think, like, I don't know, it was like the hotel was like a, like almost like a two hour drive. So they pick us up in the vans and stuff and they pick us up in a van, drive us to the, to the field in the middle of nowhere. And we're supposed to go on at midnight. And when we get there, they don't even have a tent for us because there's some other <laughs> band in there from earlier in the day. So they're like, you know, just hang out here. You know, we'll have a tent for you in a minute. Uh. So they get us in a tent. And so we're thinking we're going on in like, you know, like 15, 20 minutes. Because we were supposed to, like, you know, we had gotten there, you know, that, like, you know, arriving there when we did, it was basically supposed to be, you know, show up, play, and then leave. Mm -hmm. And so when we got there, you know, they didn't have, they didn't have a, like, you know, like a, a, a dressing room for us or anything. So they get us in the dressing room. And then they keep on telling us there's like some kind of like problem, something, <laughs> something like, you know, whatever. They're not ready for us on stage yet. So the guys start drinking. We were supposed to go on at midnight. We went on at like 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> the guys are hammered. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, why are you so fucked up? They were like, we were supposed to go on at midnight. <laughs> we're just waiting to go. Because they kept it. It wasn't like, you know, they wouldn't tell us, like, you know, look, there's there's some kind of problem. It's going to be two hours before you go on. You know, it'd be like, it, you, we'll be ready in 10 minutes. So they were telling us for, like, you know, two and a half hours, we'll be ready in 10 minutes. <laughs> so Peter and Kenny are just drinking, you know, thinking that we're going on stage in a few minutes and <laughs> there won't be any issues. Soon, you, you know, it's it's 2.30 in the morning. They've been drinking every 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, the show was a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> that was the biggest show we ever played. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, you know, you obviously are a New Yorker. Uh, you got to be a part of the New York <laughs> rock and roll scene, the CBGBs, the Maxis Kansas Cities. 
that are no longer with us anymore. And we had, had a lot of that stuff. You know what? I was kind of young. I, I missed it. I never, I never went to Max's Kansas City. Oh wow! Were you no, right? it was uh, what was it called? The first time I had gone there, it was called Tramps. Oh okay. You know, it was named something else, but like Max's Kansas City, you're talking about like you know during the time of like the New York Dolls and the Misfits mm-hmm. and stuff mm-hmm. like that. That's you know, that's just a little bit before my time. Gotcha. Uh, you know, I take it you did, or you were able to attend some shows at CB's. Uh, not too many. I went there like you know later on. You know, I didn't. I never like you know. I was aware of what was going on at, at, at CB's, like you know, like with the hardcore scene and stuff like sure. that. And they were doing like you know, like the matinees and and stuff like that. But I never went to one. You know, like the couple of times I went to CBGB's, I was kind of in a way, and I kind of look at it as I'm fortunate, even though the place was like you know, it has the the historical value. The place was a dump. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what made it historical though? Yeah. No, what made it historical was all the bands that wound up coming out of there. Sure, that right, gave it, that validated it. But the club itself was a dump. <laughs> <laughs> it, as, you know, but when you have bands like the Ramones, Blondie, and the Talking Heads and stuff like right. that playing your yeah. dump, then it kind of is like you know, then it becomes this you know part of you know rock and roll sub you know culture. But the place was a dump. <laughs> You know, and as you say that, and then it was a place that, that was a dump that was charging like you know like midtown prices for drinks. <laughs> but and, and then I was like, I'm never coming back here again. <laughs> as you say that, though, um, you know, we, I've asked this question to many of our guests: Is New York had a thriving rock and roll and, and metal scene and, and hardcore scene uh, for many years, and it's not there like it was, not even close. Um, do you ever foresee New York City getting a scene or a club scene like that ever again? Is there a, 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 that underground interest ever that you I, know? I don't of? think so. That no. just because of the you know the real estate, right? You know what what you know like a, for instance a dive bar. How's a dive bar going to pay New York City rent? Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So true. So, so you know, true. like uh, all those cool bars that, like, you know, like those ones that were like in Alphabet City and stuff like that. That was all like cheap rent. Mm-hmm. You know, like uh, uh, the first time I went down Alphabet City, I was a teenager when I played there. I played in some basement. I don't even think it was a bar. <laughs> <laughs> it was just some basement. I remember that. And I remember going outside, stepping outside of, of this basement, and it was just leveled apartment buildings. You know, it looked like you know, like when you see pictures of of New York City, like you, know, you see pictures of the Bronx from like the seventies and eight, early eighties. That's what it looked like. Mm-hmm. And now it's you know you got Whole Foods on on, on Bowery and Christie Street, you know, and, you know all this high end stuff and then like all the cool places they're all gone. And I, I don't know where. You know, where a CBGBs, for instance, where they'll be able to afford to open up a place like that and, you know, be able to keep the lights on. And, and in essence, um, your thoughts on what was the Sunset Strip in its heyday of the 80s, what you know of. I know you didn't grow up in California. Uh, no, I mean, you know, like from what I hear about it, you know, it was... Uh, what was it? It was Sodom. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean, as a kid, when I was a kid, I always wanted to go to LA because yeah. a lot of the bands that I grew up liking and stuff, they were all, you know, how they all, you know, had that love affair with, with California. And I always wanted to go there. And the first time I went there was with Typo. I was working for Typo and Kenny and I were walking around the Sunset Strip and they were still, that was like the tail end where they were still like, you know, hanging out all over the street, like, you know, giving out flyers and stuff like that. And Kenny and I we were like the this is it. <laughs> this, this, this is what they've been talking about. <laughs> I'm so bummed out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but as far as a, a renaissance of that nature ever coming back to a, a, po- a popular well, LA's culture. Going, LA's going through the same thing now. Right. You know, like a lot of the places on Sunset Strip, they're all closed. You know, a lot, a lot of the clubs that they had, they were closed and you know, like there's, there's still like, you know, there's still rock and roll bars and stuff like that in LA on like New York city. 
but I don't know as far as like a scene. I mean, it's hard to say. You know, the scene now is on social media. Yeah. It, it's such a shame. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's hard. It's you know, it's you know, it's a, I. You know, I I kind of get a feel of it too because you know, like some of these other bands that I play in, they're like you know, even though they have, you know, the 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 pedigree, you know, from other you know established bands, it's still new bands. Mm-hmm. And everything now is like, you know, there isn't any word of mouth. I'm, when I was a kid in high school, you know, you had one magazine, like two magazines in the States, and you, you had Kerrang! that came out like, you know, once a month. And you went to the record store to buy yeah. Kerrang! You couldn't buy it anywhere. Right. You know, there wasn't, a, you know, it wasn't getting played on the radio. There wasn't, you know, like, shit, Brooklyn was like the last place to get cable television. So we didn't even have t- MTV until like the the end of the 80s. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> I used to, uh, friends of mine, the guys that I played in bands with and stuff, they lived out in Long Island and I they used to record Headbangers Ball for me so and on a VHS tape and I would watch it during the week. Yeah. And that's crazy because MTV's origins were was New York City, so yeah. <laughs> yeah but, but yeah, Brooklyn was like the last place, and Brooklyn was like one of the last places to get a Seven Eleven too. Oh, <laughs> I'm not joking. I had a driver's license before we had a a Seven <laughs> Eleven. I used to have to drive to Queens to go to a Taco Bell. Was there no commercialization in? C- corporate cor- c- commercialization. Well, I mean, you know, what? there was the mall. You had the mall. Yeah. You can. There were record shops and stuff like that. But there wasn't like this. This, uh, you know, like mom and pop shops were still, I guess, a thing. Oh. And you know, you, you had like you know, the, you go to the deli, you go to the grocery store in the corner. You didn't have to go to you know for a Seven Eleven. I mean, now there's Seven Elevens everywhere. But Every, I remember it being like, everywhere. you know, I was like, I was like almost, I don't know, 19, 20 years old. And they finally, we finally got a, a, a 7-Eleven. We would go there and just buy big gulps and shit because <laughs> yeah. you could. And you're yeah. like, wow, this is awesome. That yeah, was a big deal to ride our bikes down it and was get a, big a deal. pop like, and yeah, a candy bar. Get a right, big gulp and like uh, nachos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And like we would like, we, yeah, we were piling into a car. Come on, let's go to 7-Eleven. This is awesome. <laughs> It was, and it was it was awesome for kids, you know, of all ages. But I have two more questions for you because I know we've taken a lot of your time up. But uh, no, it's fine, dude. I'm having fun. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's good. Um, yeah. I guess the question I have is Chuck Biscuits, <laughs> known punk rock drummer of the gods, what have you. Right. Um, played in Black Flag, uh, Danzig, uh, Social Distortion, The Germs, yeah. I believe. Yeah. And on and on and on. Um, as far as you, um, as a drummer, getting in and playing, you know, the Danzig stuff when Chuck was there, it Chuck was a such a, I don't know, what do you want to say, a, such a showman on the drums. Uh, what's it? Was it a challenge for you to, uh, at all, to play Chuck stuff back in the with the early Danzig stuff, or is it? Yeah. I, I, I mean, you know, I'll just put it out there right now. There's no way that I can match his showmanship. Never. You know, so it's like, it's just, he was so over the top visually. It's like, you, you don't even, it, there's no point in even trying, mm-hmm. you know, because like, it's, it's, it, it, I don't even know how to explain it. Cause it's like, you know, you'd look like an idiot trying to do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, know? you know, I would look like an idiot trying to play like, you know, perform like Chuck Biscuits. You know, I try to play like Chuck Biscuits, you know, <laughs> sonically, you know, I mean, but he was, he was a great drummer, you know, and the stuff that he played on those, on those records is, it's, it's fucking classic. And, uh, like, you know, he's just got a great feel. He's got a great swing and it gave a lot of that music, a lot of character, you know, so that that's, that's more of where I try to, you know, put my, my attention to. Sure. It, and we had, you know, but I, I would never, I would, I would look like it would, you know, I would get laughed off, off the stage. <laughs> we, we early in, in the early years of our podcast, we had um, interviewed Erie and, and John. Cry. He's fine. Yeah. 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 <laughs> both, both. It's kind of, kind of crazy. We, we interviewed um, John Christ years ago and we interviewed Erie as well. And, you know, the, the kind of, the crazy thing about it was that, that, first Danzig band 
uh, with those members in it. Uh, there were some really diverse personalities in there. And it, it always kind of made me wonder, how did those guys click the way they did? Because, I mean, you talk about some drastic personality differences. Uh, you know, uh, it, it was did, did uh, Glenn ever share as far as was, was there challenges with that band and all those different personalities to try to create that music? Uh, he, well, the, the way that he talks about it, when he does talk about the band, it's, it's not like he doesn't shit talk. Like, you know, it sounds like, you know, the impression I get from it is, is somewhat endearing. Yeah. You know, like, I don't know if it's like, you know, like that, that point in time and they were, you know, like the, like, you know, the, the ascension, you know, where the band is building and, you know, so there was a lot of, you know, everything was going up, 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 up. Uh, but uh, if he makes it sound like, you know, like like Biscuits was, you know, Biscuits was pretty out there. <laughs> but he, he t- the way that he talks about him, it sounds like he's like, you know, like like you, your crazy kid brother. <laughs> and You, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, Erie, Erie was very cynical. And if you know Erie, you know, he's got that cynical sarcasm to him. To, you know, to his personality, John, uh, John, like I know John and I know Erie, I never met biscuits, but you know, typo toured with Danzig. So mm-hmm. like, you know, I got to know them then. And then we, you know, we would cross paths. Like, you know, I'd see John when we would like, you know, play in California and stuff like that. Erie would pop up once in a while at a show and stuff. Uh, you know, John was very, you know, it, John was just very easygoing, just really nice guy. Like, you know, very easygoing. But not the cynic, like, you know, like the way Erie is or like the way Glenn is. Mm-hmm. You know, John strikes me as like, you know, like would be like the odd man out. Erie and Glenn seem to be, you could tell they come from the same neighborhood. <laughs> 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 you know, that that's, that's the, that, but that's like, you know, like I was saying, like with this lineup, like, you know, like Steve, you know, has his history with Glenn too. And, uh, you know, and we all come from like, you know, that New York, New Jersey, you know, part of the country. Mm-hmm. And there's a certain type of, you know, persona, like a certain character that that's produced from that environment. <laughs> so I think that's why we get along so well. Oh, very good. All right. So I got one more question for you. So uh, sure. I think it was like two years ago, Rex Brown was doing <laughs> he was doing some promotional stuff. Uh, and it came across from his management PR person, if we'd like to interview Rex. And obviously you've worked with Rex. Um, and so we're like, well, yeah, for sure. We'd love to have Rex on the, on, on the program. We'd love to have him on the podcast. It'd be right. fantastic, right? And so he goes, fine. That's, that, and the, we get the message back. Like, that's fantastic. Uh, yeah, we're going to give you 10 minutes. <laughs> so you got a 10 minute interview with rex <laughs> right so as i and we had a when i got the news that night i was over at our podcast uh studio was at a, a different location so uh we always would kind of do some talking back and forth and this was with my old podcast partner about you know uh-huh. hey what's what was the plan and he's like yeah we got a the the, the request in from uh, uh rex and he's like he's going to give us 10 minutes and I said, what do you do? Say welcome and goodbye? <laughs> yeah, right, get, I mean, right, get your station ID. <laughs> Thanks, Rex. <laughs> is it one of those things with Rex is that, um, in, in, in this is, you know, is he is, is it not much into doing media and PR stuff for himself? Is it just one of those things like, I just want to tell you this is what's coming out and be done with it? Or it, what is the story with Rex? He seems like a man of few words. He is a man of few words, unless you're like, you know, you're hanging out with him. Like, you know, like when I talk to him on the phone, we'll talk on the phone for like an hour and a half. Oh, okay. But we won't talk to each other for months. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Rex likes to talk with his guitar. Uh, yeah. Fair enough. And, you know, th- th- that was just one thing I just kind of, uh, for all these years now since we've started this, we're 184 episodes into this. And it was, I think it was like in round episode 20 ish or something like that i was excited you know hey yeah, rex brown what year be- was it Ooh, let's see we're in 220 so i'm guessing it was like 217 maybe 2017 maybe i think and when right when that when his uh solo album came out oh when the album came out yeah i think so it was something like oh, that yeah, yeah it was because i know i know he was doing a lot of press for that yeah 
Uh, no wonder why he was doing a lot of press for it because he was given ten minute blocks. So he's well, doing yeah, it. Yeah, quad- I guess he was trying to do it all in one day. Yeah. <laughs> Quadruple the amount or whatever. Yeah. So, but anyway, maximizing uh, your time. Yeah. <laughs> it was like a you know like the the flash of DC Comics. It was like man, let's get this in and yeah, out. But we've, I, I've been in situations like that where we've done like uh like when we were doing press for like Typo Records. Mm-hmm. And what they would do is they would break the band up. Like they would send us to uh, send us to Europe to do a uh, European press, and they would they would split the band up. And I would always go with Peter and Kenny and Josh would go together because you can't put Kenny and Peter together <laughs> because they get nothing done. <laughs> <laughs> they just they just get they just get shit faced. <laughs> so we figured it out that they have to be separated. So I would go with Peter because I always had a good calming effect on Peter, and. Uh, Josh would get stuck with Kenny. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, so we would go, for instance, we, 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 and they'd have us like, you know, jumping around the the continent. So we would be like, you know, be in Paris one day, the next day we'd fly to London, you know, like whatever, you know, go to Germany. And and what they would do is they would line up a bunch of interviews and the way it would work was we would just be sitting in a hotel room and journalists would just come in one after the other you know, take a break for like lunch or something like that. And it was, and they would have us come in. So they, for the most part, they were all very brief, you know, not, not like, like this, for instance, it wouldn't be like this where it's like, you know, there's, there's no time limit or anything. It was like in everybody. Mm -hmm. It was longer than 10 minutes, but it was pretty short. Well, you know, we get a lot of interviews where, uh, you know, the PR people will set it up and they'll say, Hey, you know, this is, Gonna, we can give you between twenty to thirty minutes, or you know, thirty minute max, or whatever it is. We've had right. that with various artists. We you know, we we traveled to Chicago to do some interview work with Mike Portnoy, and you know, we got to go back oh. in the green room, and they give us thirty minutes and you know, what have yeah. you. So that's very normal. But I had never seen a PR and management come up, come at us with ten minutes before. <laughs> All right. Are you well, kidding me? I, but that 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 does sound unusual. <laughs> <laughs> You know, well, I guess it's like, you know, you got to weed out the, you know, like the filler questions and get to the meat of everything. You have 10 minutes. Make it count. (laughs) I guess so. (laughs) That was it it was also like when we got an offer to do some gore stuff and but we could only interview the members of gore in their as their persona of gore individuals, whatever it was. I said to the PR person, I said, don't you think that that's kind of like interviewing a Muppet? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's like you, you're really not getting to the person, it's to the character, and you're never really getting. Well, the... that's what that's what Guar is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> you know, I would be disappointed if they were just in their civ- civilian clothes. <laughs> it's like it's like you know interviewing Bruce Wayne instead of Batman. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> but you know, as far as you know, when you're doing something on where where it's where it's um an audio only. And you know, there's no visual yeah. to this at all. Um, but you know, no, it, it, there is the it, it does because like when they're when they're in character, you know, it, that'll come across even you know in an audio interview, mm. even the way that you treat them mm-hmm. as the as the as the journalist, you'll approach them differently. You won't be like, oh, it's like you know, so what high school did you go to? In Virginia? <laughs> you know? yeah. Exactly, exactly. You know, you're gonna your your questions are gonna be on Antarctica, not Virginia. <laughs> You know, it's not going to be about Richmond. <laughs> well, listen, we've you know, taken enough of your know, time. How many to... skulls are in your Cheerios? <laughs> you <know? laughs> we... And then, you, like, you know, like when you will give your commentary, like, you know, when you're talking about the interview and stuff like that, you're going to go around. You're not going to say, you know, you'll make it a point to say that they were in character. Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Right? So it's, it's totally by design. It's creating the optic. You know, just by what you'll tell them. The, the the problem with the person that you're telling this to right now, that's me, <laughs> is that I have a hard time going into that mode of, you know, because we're, we're talking to you, the musician, the person, your experiences yeah. and everything. And, you know, when you're, when you, when d- doing something as challenging as doing something like a gore interview, where it's a lot of it is kind of, 
I, I, would, I hate to say this, but it's kind of like make believe type stuff, right? Yeah. I mean, it's almost like you're you're looking at it. It's totally make believe. Yeah, That's the fantasy. whole thing. Yeah. That's yeah. the whole yeah. point. And I'm not very good at that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good at that at all. They are. But, yeah. <laughs> but you know, the thing is, is that you're trying to form question. You know, to do that because I let's face it, it when when Jeff and I do this every week, we try to do our homework on you, the person, who you are, you know, your experiences and what have right. you. And we want to get to the nuts and bolts of, you know, what makes yeah. Johnny Kelly, Johnny Kelly, as yeah. far as the artist goes, you know, and uh, me doing the make believe thing is that I just don't really, but you're I'm, not going to get that from McGuire. You're not. And right. that's what I do. You know I mean? This is what we do. We they ask the questions like we, this conversation tonight. And so, yeah, it's been, yeah, I'm not in Guar. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's why. <laughs> but anyway, we, we really appreciate it. Yeah, <laughs> we do. We want to thank you so much for yeah. your participation. Thank you guys. Yeah. This yeah. was fun. Yeah. Thank you. And, yeah, thank you. Um, is there anything that you have on the horizon that you might want to plug or promote before before we let you go for the evening. Uh, what, what's going on? I mean, there's a couple of things going on. Uh, we're working at a deal now. We're trying to work on getting Dead Again re-released. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's it's been out of it's been out of print for a long time, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, we were finally able to locate it and get it back. Oh, fantastic! So now we're planning yeah. we're planning on doing a you know doing another release for it. You know. Nice. And uh, you know stuff like getting it. It's it's not even it hasn't even been on streaming services in years. Mm. And uh, so now we're we're in the process of getting that back. Uh, Silver Tunes working on new material. I just finished doing drums for the next Kill Devil Hill record. Excellent. Um, yeah, I, I went to California. I guess it was now about three weeks ago. Mm-hmm. I was out there for a week. We did uh, get all the drums done. Uh, Hookers and Blow has some shows in December. I don't know if they're going to happen, but they're scheduled. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's two of them in Northern California. I mean, I hope they happen, but I, I don't have my uh, I don't have my hopes up. I haven't booked any flights yet for it or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm expecting the worst. Uh, but anytime, yeah. like you know, anytime that we do, anytime that I've done a show so far, like you know, this you know, like since all this happened, I always try to look at the positive aspect of it and it's like all right we did the show no one got sick everything went off without a hitch maybe it's a sign of good things to come absolutely yeah. maybe we can maybe we can get back to normal or it's like you know you know other bands could see hey you know like those guys played and there wasn't any issues you know hookers and blow just played in vegas maybe vegas is going to start doing some more shows and mm-hmm. you know but then <laughs> then covid made a comeback yeah <laughs> so so I, I don't know what's going to happen. Yep. Uh, what else? What, what other bands? The Quiet Riot doesn't have anything scheduled until March. Uh, well, that'll be here before you know it. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I know. I know. And I, I can't wait because I'm, di- I'm dying to get it back out and playing. You know, otherwise I've just been, you know, been home, you know, working on new music here. Uh, you know, doing drum lessons, and you know taking care of all these dogs <laughs> my, my, my wife and i we do we uh my wife's part of a, a dog rescue here nice. in dallas oh fantastic yeah and and so now there's seven dogs in my house <laughs> <laughs> there was eight there's right behind you How so many now now we've whittled it down to seven <laughs> well you know i feel you because uh my wife and i we we've rescued uh we we have three dogs um and we, mm-hmm. out of the three that we've uh we have two two of them are rescue we also had rescued one a few years ago that passed away um of breast cancer um so oh, yeah terrible. yeah it is you just yeah. you, you 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 rescue these dogs from dire situations yeah. and you want to give them you know the best life you possibly can and when you rescue seniors you just don't get that time with them that you that that needs to yeah, to, to we, rehabilitate uh, them what did we do? Well, we started out, well, for years we had a greyhound mm. that we had gotten from a, a place in Jersey, a, a retired race dog. And then when he died, we had all this stuff in the house. Mm-hmm. And it was like, you know what? We should go bring this to Greyhound Angels. That was the name of the place that we got we got the dog from. You know, like we should we should donate this to the, to the you know, the rescue or 
And uh, so we drove down there, and it was it was a bit of a hike. It was down. It was past Atlantic City. It was like almost like three hours from where we lived. You know, so like we 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 get there, and I just start looking at dogs. I'm like, oh, check this guy out. Like you know that kind of stuff. <laughs> Wound up coming going home with a dog. The stuff didn't even get out of the car. <laughs> we, we filled the car up with all this stuff to donate. And it all wound up coming home, and we wound up with another dog. <laughs> and then when we were down here, when we moved down here, my wife wanted a, she wanted to get another dog, and we, we got this chihuahua that was at the shelter. Then we got the chihuahua. <laughs> and then my wife started getting involved with the, with this, with this uh, dog rescue here in here in Dallas mm-hmm. called uh, Rescue Row. And uh, from there, then we were, uh, there was this other dog. It was part Shih Tzu, uh, I think part Chihuahua. Anyway, he's, he's older. He's like, you know, like 13 years old, something like that, 12, 13 years old. Uh, really can't hear, and his eyesight's really bad. He can barely mm-hmm. see. My wife fell in love with him, foster fail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we, so he was, we fostered yeah. a dog for two weeks, and, yeah, we had to keep it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Simon is now part of our family and then there's and in between that there's been a actually there's been a number of dogs i mean they're all like you know success stories like you know a lot of these dogs like you know some you know some were like you know knocking on death's door and we've been able to mm-hmm. like you know nurse them back to health and now they're living great lives and my wife's really particular about who she uh you know who she lets these dogs go to mm-hmm. and uh and then another dog that we have Lita, who I couldn't let go. She's like five pounds. She's like this little tiny chihuahua. And she's uh, basically, she's a long term, she's a hospice. She has heart failure. And she's like, I don't know, maybe like six, seven years old right by now. But I don't know. Eventually it's going to happen, but this dog's doing great. <laughs> Fantastic. And she went to, she went to a home, like, you know, like somebody was going to like, you know, take her on, like, you know, take them. And, uh, like the mother had like Alzheimer's and let the dog out of the house and didn't mm. even know it. Oh, mm-hmm. So Bernadette, my wife brought him, brought her back home and they, they got a couple of applications and stuff. And then I was like, no, let's just keep her. <laughs> so that was four that's number five (laughs) and now we have two other ones here that we're fostering two two small chihuahuas oh excellent excellent yeah well that is all we have for you tonight we want to uh we'll have this episode up and running for you in about two weeks and when it's all edited when jeff the editing wizard here is done with it we'll have the link and i'll send it to you directly and yeah cool that'd be great and if you could share it to your social media that'd be fantastic Absolutely. Yeah, we really appreciate you taking the time with us. Yeah, thank you thank so much. You, man. This was this was a lot of fun. I, we appreciate it. And if you ever want to come back on, you know, we're you know you know me on social media. Yeah, whenever, but, whenever you want to, whenever you want to do it, or like you know, like if I have something, you know, if I actually have something going on. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> or if, if <laughs> that'd if you, be nice. Yeah, or if you just want to just you know come back on to talk <laughs> yeah. music or uh, do an intro yeah. with minutes. Yeah, do an intro with us for yeah, 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or, uh, right. I'll, I'll, I'll fit you in. <laughs> or if you want to do it, exactly. If you want to do an intro with us about another artist that you've worked with or that you know, you know, whatever, I can always just say, hey, we're doing this person this yeah. week. You want to come do an intro with us? That'd be fantastic. That'd be great, man. Yeah. Thanks. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much and have a great night. All right, man. Thank Take you care. guys. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.